Good morning. So <laughs> let's start the lecture. Just a reminder: the midterm is on Friday. Okay. Um, actually, I haven't got my exam question ready yet. So, uh, uh, 15 minutes. I would anticipate uh, maybe three questions, something like that. Okay. Yeah. One for each chapter kind of thing, uh, yeah, there will be a question definitely on assignment number three. Basically, the fatigue uh, uh, loading with the uh, complete reversed uh, uh, stress. Okay, yeah. So there will be another question on static loading for sure, right? Either brittle or ductile material. Okay. And uh, what else? Uh, there will be another question for sure. <laughs> I don't know. So um, I'll make sure 15 minutes is enough. But it's going to be tight, I would expect. OK? Yeah. Sir, what, which sheets are you going to give us? Are you going to give us like the MS, like a, a couple sheets that you have already? Yeah, you can bring that into the exam. <coughs> the one that ha they're handing out to you guys. OK. Yeah. And you can prepare a formula sheet of yourself. You can use a calculator. There's no restriction. Graphical ones is good. OK? Yeah. So. <coughs> Just a quick review of what we did in the previous lecture. <coughs> uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about is a fatigue loading, a fatigue failure under fluctuating loads. Okay. <coughs> so <coughs> basically, we talked about uh, four different uh, fatigue theories, uh, which are curve fading, different kind of curve fading based on experimental data. Okay. So Soderbergh, ASME, modified Goodman, Gerber line, and plus, <coughs> sorry. One Langer line, which is the basically uh, the static yielding line. Okay, <coughs> and here's a table uh, summarize all the different fatigue failure theories. So I have a handout. Maybe you can uh, uh, pass it out here. Thank you. So the handout essentially is a as a summary of all the fatigue failure theories loading. Okay, you don't need this for the midterm, but you can bring it uh, to the mid final exam. All right? Yeah. So <coughs> among all of them, we know that this is the most conservative one, okay. and this is the most used one. Okay. okay. So in the previous example, pre previous lecture, we started example. So here's example. So suppose there is a steel bar under cyclic loading. Okay, so I read it down in the previous lecture. What's the maximum stress? What's the minimum stress? That's why we would call this as a fluctuated loading, right? Because sigma mean is not zero. And the material has SUTSY as listed here. And uh, we have a fully corrected SE value, okay, so we don't need to correct anymore. And uh, assuming a uh, fatigue strength fraction 0 0.9. And then uh, we're going to make a look at it as uh, uh, what is the safety factor according to modified Goodman? If, uh, and it's Gerber, uh, you can calculate the coin. If the safety factor is less than, less than 1, and that means we have a uh, finite number of life for, uh, for this part. And then the next question should be, how many number cycles right, will the part uh, fill, okay, basically, uh, under this uh, loading condition? Okay? Yeah. So let's continue from here. Okay. Now, uh, what, what we learned in terms of number cycle, the, the, que the uh, formula is capital N equal sigma A over A1 over B. Okay? So that's what we learned about the formula. Can I get rid of this? And A value, <coughs> here we go. So A value equal to F S U T square over S E and B is one third log F S U T S E. Okay? Now I said this is basically part of your midterm exam question, like uh, this kind of formula, right? 
Well, if, if you want to use this formula, then you have to know that this formula applies only to completely reversed stress or loading. Okay? So which means <coughs> you can only use this formula when sigma m is zero. But in this question, it's a fluctuate loading sigma m is not zero, right? So even though we have a sigma a value, we have everything else, but we can't use this formula okay, for calculation of this uh, number of cycles. Okay? Yeah. So now the question is, how can we modify this formula here in order to properly use uh, this, the, uh, uh, to calculate, properly calculate this number cycle to failure? So here's the idea. Okay? Uh, let's roughly draw the stress and uh, a number cycle SN diagram. If uh, the modif if you use the modified Goodman and the curve is look like this, right? So this is S E, this is S U T. Okay? Yeah. So for this particular curve, we need to understand this basically is um, every if you pick every point on the curve, okay, pick every point on the curve. What does that mean? How many number cycles will it fill for all the points on the on this on this boundary here. What does this curve represent first of all? Any point beyond see this is your sigma A, this is your sigma M pair, right? Any point beyond this one here you have finite. finite. Any point here is infinite. So basically this is the boundary here, right? Or any points on the boundary we consider that to ten to the power of uh, six. Okay? Yeah. So, technically speaking, any points within here, you have a larger than 10 to the power of 6 number of cycles, right? Yeah. So, for all the points on the curve, you have a 10 to the power of number of cycle <coughs> is 10 to the power of 6. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So, if I cannot use this one here, because we have a, so basically in this case, sigma m is not 0. Okay? Sigma m is not 0. Then, what can we do then? The idea is, if I still want to make use of this formula at here, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the objective is, we want to find okay, an equivalent, sig let, let's call it uh, C sigma REV, okay, you know, I'm not sure what my REV represents, Revolut maybe? So let's call it, I want to find an equivalent sigma REV here. This is basically an amplitude value. And this one here, this is basically under this completely reversed loading, okay? This is the value, this is the magnitude of a certain completely reversed stress. Is that good? Right? This completely reversed stress magnitude. Okay? So Essentially, you have a certain kind of a complete reverse, and this value here, sigma R E V. Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to find an equivalent this guy here that will do, that will do the same damage as a pair of a sigma A, sigma M. Okay. So that's the point here to find this one here, which does okay same damage. as sigma a, sigma m, this pair, okay? Yeah. So essentially, here is sigma r e v, zero, okay? Which does the equivalent damage, okay, as the sigma a, sigma m pair at here, okay? Yeah. Is the idea good? So then let's go back to this curve here. Now, given the current state of stress, the, the pair, the coordinate sigma a, sigma m, because you have a finite number of life, so that sigma a, sigma m does it definitely, it's not going to fall in over here, right? It's going to fall somewhere maybe uh, beyond this uh, curve here. Let's call this a tender. Let's say maybe it's it's here. Okay, uh, a little bit, a uh, little bit room on the top there. Okay, so. Let's say this is 10 to the power 6. Let's say it's somewhere here. OK? 
Okay? Somewhere here. Okay. Okay, so if I want to meet your same idea, see here, if I draw a line like this, right? If I draw a line like this, and I said this is the boundary, and this boundary there is 10 to the power of 6. Now, if I do an equivalent uh, idea here, if I connect this point with that point, okay, and then draw a straight line, let's use a red color, okay? Then, for this particular line, okay, the same idea, this line here, for any point along this line, I would have, a, I, a theoretically, I would have what? Same exactly, the same number of cycles, right? And what does the intersection of that line with the vertical one means? That means sigma m equal to zero, right? So basically, at the, the point over here should give me Theoretically, of course, not practically. Should, should theoretically give me, give me the same number cycle to fit here at this period here, right? And this point here is exactly the point when you have sigma m equal to zero. So this value, I would call that my sigma REV that we are looking for here. Is that good, right? Yeah, okay. So, of course, the whole question basically boils down to uh, what, is the, what is the line equation now, right? What's the line equation and how do we find the sigma REV? So it's actually pretty easy because you already have the point over here, you already have a point here. You can easily construct the line equation by going through these two coordinates here, right? Yeah. Just like the line equation going through the SE and here. So remember the modified Goodman line is which one? It's this guy here, right? Modified Goodman is this. So then in our particular case, the uh, uh, the line equation over there is going to be basically sigma REV. This is like the sigma A. Then over S, uh, over, no, over, uh, over what? No, over sigma A. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Sigma A over sigma REV minus sigma m over s u t and equal to 1. Okay, so that's the line equation here. Okay, yeah. And solve for sigma r e v, we end up with this. Okay, solve for sigma r e v. Okay, so that's the intersection of the line with the vertical axis. Okay, so we have a sigma a, we have sigma m, so you can calculate sigma REV easily, uh, which is 53.3 KSI, okay, like this. And that's, that value is higher than SE, right? You can see basically SE is 40. That value is higher than SE here, okay? Yeah. Now, this is basically the sigma, R, the sigma REV value is going to be the sigma A value right here that we're going to use, okay, for calculating the numbers <coughs> cycle to failure. Okay, because this this location right here is kind of like a complete reverse uh, loading here now, right? Yeah, and it does it, it it does the same damage at this pair. Okay, so now my number of cycle here is sigma REV over uh, A and then one over B. Okay, yeah. So A B value you can calculate e easily using this given S U T and S E and F value, sigma REV is calculated. So overall, this is a, a known number now. Okay, so 3.4 times 10 to the power, uh, 10 to the point, 10 to the power four cycles. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then this is basically using. This this line here is using modified Goodman kind of a theory, right? Modified Goodman theory. If you wanted to use the, like the question, say uh, maybe Gerber criteria or some other criteria, uh, then the calculation of sigma REV will be uh, slightly different. And you all you need to do actually just uh, kind of stick to uh, the formulas over here in terms of the uh, calculation. So all you need to do is change the SE to sigma. Uh, REV. So, for example, if I decided to use the Gerber line to calculate number cycle to fit here, then we're going to change this SE value to sigma REV, 
and then calculate the sigma REV. Right? So for example here, using Gerber, and that sigma REV will become sigma A over 1 minus sigma M over SU T squared. Okay? Alright? So this will be 42.7 KSI. Okay, 42.7 KSI. So this is smaller now, right? If you use a calculation of n, and you should actually get higher number of cycles. Okay, higher number of cycles. So quite a quite a bit of difference actually, right? Quite a bit of difference. Okay. In terms of number of cycles, one is 10 to the power of four, the other is 10 to the power of five. Okay. Yeah. And apparently, which one is more conservative here? Which one? Which which criteria? Modified Gumel or Gerber? Modified Gerber. Modified right? And th does that make sense? Because you look at the 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 uh, modified Gutmann is where it's this guy here, right? It's this guy, and Gerber is over here. So apparently, the current state of stress it's not falling this location, right? <coughs> somewhere, uh, somewhere maybe over here. Okay. Yeah, Jim. I have a question about when you did sigma a over sigma reversible. Yeah. You wrote minus sigma m over sut. Oh, it should be plus. Yes. Yeah. Plus. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you know, it, the the, the uh, uh, original ten to the power of six line is this, right? The original ten to the power of six line is this. Okay. So this is ten to the power of six line equation, and now we need an a, a, a n, you know, other than ten to the power of six. So the basically the sigma the SE value is changed to sigma REV. Okay. Yeah. If you compare these two here, right? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now you basically have uh, two different ways of calculating the number of cycles to feed here. One is for complete reverse loading, and the other is for uh, uh, fed, uh, for uh, uh, fluctuated loading. Okay. So let's continue it right here. Um, now, everything that we have been talking about here is uh, normal stress. So basically, we consider this is either completely completely reversed normal stress or, or fluctuated normal stress, right? And you could also have uh, a fluctuated torsional stress, okay? So what if we have, let's see, a torsional loading, okay? And it's a fluctuated. So then what do we do? Right. Instead of uh, basically deriving everything from scratch, what we can do is we can do a little analogy here. <coughs> so instead of a tau a, instead of a sigma a sigma m, so now we have tau a, a tau m. Right. So amplitude of shear stress and mean of shear stress. So all you need to do is the following step here. Okay. Uh, you st we still try to make use of uh, the fatigue theories, the criteria that we had. Uh, we have shown there the four different ones. So we get basically replace sigma a and sigma m, okay, with uh, tau a and tau m, okay. So we replace sigma a, sigma m is the tau a, tau m, and then because this is a torsional loading, so when you calculate, so when you calculate this S E the fatigue strength, the endurance limit, then there is a loading condition, the Kc factor, right? Okay, loading condition Kc. So that Kc needs to be 0.59. Okay, that's, that's, that's what you need to basically uh, uh, correct the Se prime. And Su value, Sut, Sut value is tensile. So we we're gonna change that with SSU. Okay, SSU. And SSU, I think we pointed this out in one of the equations from the textbook. Uh, it's empirical ones, it's 0 0.67 SUT. Okay, so this is the shear ultimate strength. Okay, now if I look at the formulas 
the four different formulas uh, here. So some formula use SUT, some formula use SYT, right? So uh, if I use the, the Soderberg line here, then what do we do with SY then? So same thing. So we're going to replace this SYT with SSY. Now SSY, if you recall that uh, when we're deriving this uh, well, Mrs. Uh, well, Mrs. stress or well, Mrs. theory, we derived SSY is actually equal to approximately what? Yeah. Right? It's 0.577 SYT. Okay? Yeah. So that's all the replacement that you need to basically uh, to, to do that in terms of which criteria you're going to choose. All right? Yeah. So that's basically torsional type of loading here. Okay? Any questions? All good? So let's move on here. Now let's consider even, uh, actually before we consider, just a second here. Uh, let's consider the fatigue uh, stress concentration factor. You know, when we, uh, in the previous lecture, we learned fatigue stress concentration factor. So fatigue stress okay, concentration factor, okay, Kf or K. Now this, this time, uh, we're, what we're dealing with, because this, this is basically a fluctuated loading. You have a sigma A, you have a sigma M. So the question is, how do we apply this fatigue stress concentration factor, essentially, all right? So, uh, if you look really at the textbook, it's, it's actually a, there, there are different uh, research papers regarding the proper ways of applying the fatigue stress concentration factor under fluctuated loading. Okay, so without going into too much details here, so I'm, I'll just write down uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 type of uh, the approach that we apply the key effort here. Okay, in this lecture, in, in this class. Okay, so we have sigma a, we have sigma m. Let's say this is a nominal value. Okay, those are nominal values. Okay. Yeah, and now you have a geometry. Uh, discontinuity, so there's a fatigue stress concentration factor, Kf. Then, when you do design, <coughs> if you want to, <coughs> if you want to prevent, okay, local yielding, okay, if you want to prevent local yielding, <coughs> then what you do is, your basically your actual sigma a is kf times sigma a nominal, and your actual sigma m is kf times sigma m nominal. Okay, this is what you do. Okay, yeah, because ultimately the combination of these two will result in whether you have a local yielding or not. So when you apply the kf. <coughs> You know, think about here. So what's, what's the point of applying a, a stress concentration factor? Well, basically, what's the point of basically uh, raise up this nominal value for design? So, you know, the, the here is actual, okay, here is what you think, 20 PSI. And then you multiply by 2, for example, right? And you make it, you make it the, after the stress calculation to become 40 now, okay? So what, what's the whole point of doing this? Safety, right? Exactly. So basically, you're trying to prevent something from happening, essentially. Huh? Yeah. Now, that's exactly the point here. You know, uh, if you want to prevent that from happening, you apply this, you know, to basically actually explode the, the actual value. Maybe it's not going to happen, right? But it's just you're just preventing the thing from happening here. Okay. And of course, uh, you, if you're saying is okay, if local yielding okay is not avoidable, okay. So if you remember, when we see the, uh, the local, the difference uh, between the local yielding and the general yielding, right? The local yielding does what? Only cause the strain strengthening, okay? Strain strengthening. So if that's not avoidable, basically, which means what? Uh, let's say you, you know the stress concentration factor, maybe it is two. But when you time the two, actually, you know, it's already beyond your SYT, right? When it's beyond your SYT, 
your two times thirty is sixty, but actually your SYT is forty. So you're not going to be able actually to reach the sixty. See what I'm saying, right? So your maximum is clamped at this SYT value. Okay. So in that particular case, that means the local yielding is not avoidable. Then what do we do is we we can forget about that uh, uh, the sigma m. Okay. We can just apply. Okay. Uh, sorry. We can just apply the key f to sigma a only. All right. Yeah. So this is a key f. Now, in most of the cases, when you do design, uh, you're going to basically try this one here. Okay? Yeah. And if you have a torsional, then instead of calling it a key F, you call that key FS. Right? Same idea. Okay? So just change the sigma to tau. Okay, so that's fatigue, uh, fatigue stress concentration factor. Okay, one more topic here, and then we, uh, we're done with the fatigue loading. And that's actually the last one here is the most commonly used one when you're later for shaft design. And this is called combined loading. Okay, so combined loading. So combined loading meaning we have a situation that not only only the sigma A, sigma M, it's a combination of sigma A, sigma M and tau A, tau F. All right. So, for example, I'll give you a, sh a loading condition of a shaft like this. <coughs> if we have a shaft, okay, subjected to a loading, okay, and apparently you will have two supporting force at the two ends, okay. So let's say the shaft is rotating, okay, at omega, and this is a constant, okay. This is a constant. So if you look at the, if you consider this loading condition, uh, what would you call uh, the what 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 would the uh, shaft feel basically in the end? So shaft is rotating, but F is a constant. So this is gonna give you flutter loading or complete reversed, right? Okay. So now I'm gonna add a torque, okay, a constant torque to the shaft. A constant torque to the shaft. Okay. So then what happens, right? So the F here give you a sigma. The F the over there, right? Give you a sigma A. Okay, completely reversed. What does that tor uh, constant torque do, uh, do to this? Uh, 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 do to the shaft then? What what's that going to add to the shaft? The torque, of course, torsional she shear stress, right? Shear stress. Is it going to cause uh, a fluctuated shear stress, or is it going to cause a complete reverse shear stress, or is it going to just cause constant, right? So if you cut a cross section, the torque will just cause constant shear stress. So basically, the torque will give you, if I consider this is a Still a, a sort of a sh uh, fluctuating loading, so basically we're gonna kind of have a constant here. We call it tau m, right? Call it tau m. Okay. Yeah. So, given these two loading conditions here, okay, f and the t, both are constant. This is quite common because when you have a shaft carrying uh, a gear, okay, then uh, the gear, let's say gearbox, which you're going to design, the gear, the gear will drive another one there. This, this the pinion drives the gear. Then um, you will have a torque okay, generated, and you will have the action reaction force on the gear. That's basically this guy here. Okay, and chances are probably two two planes. So in this particular case, that's the combined loading you have here. So then, in this particular case, what do we have? We have sigma a not zero, and sigma m equal to zero. Tau A equal to zero. And tau M not zero. Is that right? Yeah. So that's one example of a combined loading here. Okay. Yeah. So here comes the question now. So what do we what how can we use, you know, in terms of the uh, failure theories, right, for combined loading here? 
And we can't use, you know, the modify Goodman uh, or any of the line here because those are for complete reverse stress. And we can't use the mo the the uh, the uh, the modified uh, this guy here and modified the torsion and loading. Those are just purely for tau a tau n, right? So what we need to do is basically uh, we need to consider ourselves, okay, uh, a kind of an equivalent situation here. So here's what we want to do. Let's say I have, okay, sigma a. Okay, so the sigma a again, okay, here's the thing here. Sigma A is a normal stress, and uh, as we learned from uh, uh, the first lecture, what causes normal stress? It could come from where? Bending. It could come from axial. axial. It could come also come from. Uh, no, that's it, right? Uh, <laughs> so sigma A comes from axial. Uh, sigma A comes from uh, bending. Okay. Yeah. And the amplitude tau A. Could come from where? Could come from torsion, right? Okay, yeah. So those are the uh, the A components, right? The A components here, the amplitude component. So these are A components, or, or you can call the sigma component. Maybe I can use what we learned that the distortion energy theory. So. We can combine this together to come up with sigma a prime, okay? Sigma a prime, okay? So this is basically like this, right? So I have, let's say, if you have a stress element, okay, you have a stress element here. Then you have probably sigma a axial here, okay? And then you probably have a sigma a bending, okay? from the bending. Then you also have the tau A here. So let's say maybe this direction. Okay. So this is tau A coming from a torsion. Okay, coming from a torsion. So you might wonder uh, what happened to that uh, tau A coming from shear force. Right? It's possible, right? Yeah. Now back to this, my uh, repeated uh, reminder. When you have a shaft, particularly <laughs> the bending one, okay, generally will cause more critical situation than the shear force. So we typically just look at the top and the bottom edge at which location the shear stress due to the shear force is zero, right? Okay, yeah. So that's the basically the loading condition, right? This is the stress element. And this is the stress element. We want to come up with a sigma A prime using the von Mises stress. And what is the von Mises stress formula again? Uh, it's, it's what? It's uh, sigma prime equal to uh, square root sigma x squared minus uh, sigma x sigma y plus sigma y squared plus uh, 3 tau x y squared, right? Yeah, that's the uh, uh, von Mises stress formula. And it is for plane, of, plane state of stress. Okay, so if you if you compare the current state of stress, okay, with the formula here, and what is the sigma x? Let's say the combination of these two is sigma x, right? Okay. Do we have a sigma y? We don't, huh? Yeah, and we have a tau x y, which is this quantity here. Okay, this quantity. So what would be the sigma a prime now? Sigma A prime, okay. Basically, you substitute all those things into here. Now, before we do that, don't forget that we also have a stress fatigue stress concentration factor, right? So, <coughs> technically, we need to apply our stress concentration factor to each one of these quantities at here, okay? Each one of the, the stresses here, okay? So now, this has basically become a slightly a bigger formula here. Kf. This is a KF for bending. Okay, KF for bending. So we use this fatigue stress concentration factor times sigma A bending. Okay, yeah. Because fatigue stress concentration factor will be different 
for bending condition and uh, or for axial loading condition, right? Because you look up a different figures to get the KT value. And then you have KF, axial uh, type of uh, fatigue stress control factor, that times sigma A axial. Okay, sigma axial. Okay, for this particular one here, the formula, okay, I'll temporarily see here, I'll explain this. We need to divide by 0 0.85. Okay, I'll explain why. Okay, now we need to divide by 0 0.85 here. And first of all, you know, what does 0 0.85 remind you? If you, re if you can remember. Uh, not a KC? Oh, yes, KC, exactly, sorry. <laughs> uh, KC is the loading factor when you calculate the SE, right? So it shows up right here. So I'll explain why it shows up here, okay? So we plug it into this quantity for sigma x. So altogether, this guy's square, right? That's a sigma x square, okay? KC, okay? And then plus the 3 times this guy. So we have a KFS, okay? KFS for torsion, okay? Okay, for torsion. And then time the tau xy, which is this tau a torsion, okay? And this guy square, okay? Yeah, this guy square. And all together, everything, what do we do? The square root, right? The square root. So that's sigma a prime, okay? That's sigma a prime. And similarly, we have a sigma m prime. So all you need to do is change those a, a, a to the m thing, right? To the m. So we have the, the corresponding formula for sigma m prime. However, the difference between sigma a prime and sigma m prime is you, you won't have the 0 0.85 anymore. Okay, so everything is the same. So here we call KF bending, sigma M bending, okay, plus KF axial. Now this time you don't divide it by 0 0.85, okay? Yeah, just this, okay, just this. Okay, let me explain this uh, after I write down the formula here, okay? Then 3 KFS torsion tall M torsion square everything square root. Okay, that's how you calculate sigma A prime and sigma M prime. Once you get sigma A prime, sigma M prime, this is what you're going to use for those fatigue theories. If I decided to use modified agreement, so what do we do? Sigma A prime over SE sigma m prime over sut, okay, and equal to 1 over nf. Is that okay? okay? This is the procedural things, basically, okay, for combined loading condition, okay, for combined loading condition. Any questions on this, uh, the way that the, the idea here in terms of sigma a prime, sigma m prime? Okay, so now let me explain this one here a little bit here, okay? So as, as first observation, what do you compare sigma A prime? It's always compared with the SE, right? And what do you compare the sigma M? It's always for SUT, okay? Yeah. And that basically, one, one, the difference I kind of explain here, why would you wouldn't need this 0 0.85. And second of all, let's look at this sigma A prime here, okay? Let's do it here, okay? So, uh, what 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 about the condition that we don't have we don't have this sigma a bending we don't have tau a torsion and then then what happens here? So if only sigma a axial okay, exists, okay, if this this is the only component exists, and what does the sigma a prime become now? <coughs> Right. Sigma A prime, according to this formula, <coughs> what does that become? So 
this is square here, the square will cancel the square root. It basically will become kf time the x for the axial ones and sigma a axial over 0 0.85, right? Over 0 0.85. Okay? So if I plug this term into this formula, so let's say if this is the only thing exists, what does this formula become now? The formula just become what? The safety factor <coughs> equal, you plug it into here, right? Plug in, there's no this guy here now, plug it into here. We'll see where does that 0 0.85 go? Where does the 0 0.85 go now? The 0 0.85 appears right in front of this SE. That makes sense? So what, what does 0 0.85 that appears to do now? Basically, you are correcting this SE value with what condition? Axial loading condition, right? Axial loading condition here. Exactly. So that's basically the point. You already figured out SE now. So then when you figure out the SE value, what do we use the KC at that time? 1. Right? Remember in the uh, SE we said for combined loading, the KC value is 1. But now because there's this extra component existence here, and that 0 0.85 shows up now, right? Okay? So you're not basically getting rid of that the effect. Does that make sense? So basically for SE, okay, you use KC equal to 1 for combined loading. Okay, yeah. But when we use the sigma A prime, the KC value 0 0.85 is still there. Okay, it's still there. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense when you're doing both the bending and axial. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing this axial, wouldn't you have figured out SD with that KC value already? Exactly. But you look at that the way that you're doing here. There's there's no difference now. Even though you you use KC equal to one for combined loading, right? Basically, you consider right. the sigma x only as a combined loading. But even if it's a complete reverse, right? So everything merged together, basically. Okay. Yeah. Is that good? Okay. okay, so second of all, the other question is, uh, when you're under torsional loading, you know, when you're under torsional loading for completely reversed torsional loading, what is the KC value again? 0 0.59. Okay, 0 0.59 if you look at your uh, formula sheet over your textbook. Okay, so the question here is, why, why aren't we that uh, dividing by 0 0.59 or, or putting the 0 0.59 into this uh, one mesa stress here? So basically, let's, take, let's consider this situation, okay? So what if we have tau A axial, okay? We have tau A axial only. Okay, so pure torsion. So if you have a pure torsion, what is that uh, sigma a prime now? Okay, according to the formula, you put everything into zero except this guy here, sigma a prime equal to square root of uh, three, right? And then KFS torsion times tau a axial, okay, like this. And then, when we compare our safety factor, okay, when we compare our safety factor, the n value will become SE over sigma A prime, okay, over sigma A prime. So you plug this one over here, 
What is the value of 1 over root 3? Which is 0.577. So how close that is to 0 0.59? Pretty, right? Yeah. So this is basically the reason you don't need to have a 0 0.59 over here. Okay? Just like 0 0.85. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, the textbook uh, doesn't explain why this, why that, right? But this is basically the underlying reason, you know, for uh, existence of 0 .0 0 0.85 but not 0 0.59. Okay? Yeah. Okay? So let's take a quick look at an example and then uh, uh, before we go ahead, uh, maybe, uh, maybe another issue right here. Okay. So let's look at the first cycle yielding. Okay, first cycle yielding. Okay. <coughs> so first cycle yielding, technically what you do is you use sigma A plus sigma M if it's a fluctuated loading. Okay? Fluctuated loading. Now because this is not a fluctuated loading now, so what we need, see this is a, they basically give you kind of sigma max, right? This gives you sigma max. But because this is not a fluctuated loading, it's a combined loading. So technically speaking, what you need to calculate is what's the actual sigma max? So actual sigma max. Okay. Yeah. So actual sigma max, what you have to really look at is, is your stress element. Okay. When you look, when you can look at the stress element, you have a sigma a, you have a sigma m, and then you have tau a, and then you have a tau m. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure where tau a, tau m, or sigma a, sigma m from due to the different loading, but that's basically what's going to be, right? Yeah. So here's a state of stress. How do we calculate the actual max? We can use uh, we can use one uh, one size uh, one size uh, theory uh, uh, formula. Okay. If I use one size formula, then it's going to be what this guy plus that guy, and then plus three tau a tau m square, right? It's going to be this, okay? Yeah. So basically sigma x square plus 3 tau x where tau x y square, okay? That's your one well, size stress. And that's going to be your actual ones, okay? It's going to be your actual ones. And then you can use this to compare with sy, right? Compare with sy for first cycle yielding, okay? So, an approximate, an approximate one of formula is this. We consider the sigma x prime just basically sigma a prime plus sigma m prime. Okay, that's approximate one. And sigma a prime, sigma m prime, are the ones that we just derived. Okay, that the formula using one Okay, formula. And chances are most chances this this guy here is greater than that. Okay, it's greater. So you end up with a greater value. So basically, if you use the approximated one, this formula here, you are actually a bit more conservative, right? Yeah. So which is not a bad thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So it depends on the question, then you can uh, decide on which one uh, to use, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, let's uh, just a uh, few few more minutes then. <coughs> okay, suppose we have a notched bar. So basically, there's a stress concentration in it. So the bar is subjected to a T max equal to 160 and T mean equal to 20. M A okay, equal to zero and M M equal to 150. Okay, make your pop. 
Okay, so this is a basically combined loading we're considering it here, okay? Yeah, combined loading. So you can try to imagine the bar basically subject to torsion like this. At the same time, uh, there's a bending moment, but it's not uh, a fluctuating. It's a constant uh, bending moment applied to it, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, based on this condition here, uh, we can calculate Tm. We can calculate TA okay, Newton meter okay, or standard unit. M -A -M -M, M -A -M -M is given, so we don't need. So we have, we have all the basically uh, loading mean and loading amplitude. Then what we need is uh, we need to basically calculate tau A tau m and sigma a gonna be zero and sigma m right so the three quantities here okay three quantities okay so uh, when we do the calculation uh, because of the not the existence of notch so we actually need to calculate uh, the uh, all the st st stress at this notch location so we use that small d diameter for the calculation right uh, so basically this guy tau a will be t a half the diameter over J. And this will be Tm half of diameter and over J, right? Sigma M will be Mm half of diameter over I. Okay, so nothing, nothing uh, uh, new out of here. Just plug in these numbers and you can calculate, right? Yeah. And once you get these numbers here, so this number is 163. <coughs> Under six, there's no uh, sixteen point three. This is twenty one. This is ninety three point eight. Okay, yeah. Uh, I guess I missed the thing here because of the existing notch, uh, we do have a stress concentration factor. Okay, we do have stress concern. So let's say you have the stress concern factor already. Okay, somehow you figured out. Okay, yeah. and those are the numbers we get. It. Okay. And what do we what do we do next? We calculate the, this uh, sigma a prime and sigma m prime. And sigma a prime, in this particular case, uh, what are existence of uh, a component? There's only tall a existed here, right? There's only tall a. So if you can see the formula, it's actually basically a three tau a, a square and uh, square root, right? Square root. Okay. So that gives us uh, uh, twenty a point two sigma m. There are two components. There's tau m and sigma m. So that gives us a sigma m square plus three tau m square one half. Okay. So which is one hundred point six megapascal. So that's tau a, and sigma a prime and sigma m prime. And now the last step to calculate the safety factor. Okay. So we, if we decided to use uh, uh, in this question, uh, what did I use? I used a Gerber somehow. Okay. So anyway, uh, what are the Gerber lines here? So there is a safety factor <coughs> Gerber ones. Is right over here, right? Right over here. So we have to solve for sigma. In your formula handout, you have an NF in terms of Gerber. It's probably the most complete one. And you can calculate the safety factor. It's approximately 3.0. Okay? 3.0. Last step, check the static. So statics, SYT. I'm using the, f the approximated formula. So this is going to give us 2.87. Okay, 2.87. <coughs> All right, so that's it. Basically, the overall uh, steps for this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.